very very good evening everybody ladies and gentlemen and a warm welcome to the fifth narayan Bar late narayan varma memorial lecture on this the 20th day of august uh, which happens to be his 89th birthday which unfortunately he is not with us to share uh, this year we are having the memorial lecture which is a combination of a tradition as well as something unique and which is especially because uh, the unique part of it is a of course that we are going to be dealing with a subject which probably a year ago not a single one amongst us could have ever imagined that this is going to be a subject of concern to all of us so in that sense it is unique that we are looking at uh, this uh, subject that is COVID-19, now, next and beyond. It is also unique because instead of meeting in person, we are all going to be meeting through the medium of this webinar. I would say that is entirely fitting the memorial lecture to our stalwart uh, Mr. Narayan Verma uh, because he was one person, one quality that he had was his, always uh, his willingness to try something new. I have had the good fortune of interacting closely with him. In fact, uh, my whole stint in public life started because of the prodding that Narayan Verma had given me to write my first ever published article. And he had that, you know, that bubbling childlike enthusiasm and curiosity and was never afraid to try something new, even risking people like me writing articles in public. But then he was also brimming with ideas and therefore we are using this new medium. Uh, why I am mentioning, of course, all of us have grown accustomed to it, but we have got participants from across the country. So just a humble uh, point that I would make is that in case we face some glitches, there is some time lag at times and some people have difficulty logging in, etc. Please pardon us for that. We will try our level best to see that we... Uh, deliver in the best manner possible. Now, today's meeting in memory of uh, late Sri Narayan Verma, four eminent organizations have pulled in in getting this program together and have been doing so in the past also. Basically, because all these associations are those with which Narayan Bhai was very closely associated and all of them have a common thread of being involved in public life in some way or the other, just as Narayan Bhai was there, motivated by public good and public interest. Therefore, this subject that we are going to be dealing with, that is COVID-19, some of the aspects which the eminent experts will be speaking on, I am sure like Narayan Bhai would have wanted, they are going to be talking about it in a very positive spirit, how best we can deal with it. And I am sure you will have a lot to pick up from them. Each of these organizations will be very briefly mentioning these four organizations. I'll first mention the Bombay Chartered Accountant, uh, sorry, the BCS Foundation, which is an offshoot of the Bombay Chartered Accountant Society, because the BCAS itself is limited to the sphere of education, whereas the foundation, the BCAS Foundation, mm -hmm. is more involved in issues relating to charitable activity, seeing that the work that is done uh, is able to reach across to a larger segment of society rather than just chartered accountants. And of course, BCA, which by itself is a professional organization having more than 9,000 members, is continuously involved in upgrading knowledge and skills of its member chartered accountants through its various publications its journal, which Narayan Bhai headed for so many years as an editor and uh, through various programs such as the uh, RRCs and so on. Uh, we have with us the president of uh, Bombay Chartered Accountant Society, Mr. Suhas Paranspe, who will be representing that organization. The next uh, co-organizer is the Dharm Dharma Bharati Mission, uh, which is ably represented by uh, Mr. Paramjit Singh. This mission has had some very fine work that they have been doing. Uh, they are engaged in giving assistance in education, healthcare, livelihood skills, and so on. 
and they are running three major programs apart from a host of other activities. One is the Kuch Or for the underprivileged children. One is the Youth for Governance. Basically, uh, when uh, all these issues are there, they need to actually get all these people empowered for that. And uh, sorry, this Kuch Or I think is a uh, issue of public govern public uh, concern for governance uh, sorry the uh, dharm bharti is of course engaged in various other programs then of course we have the public concern for governance trust which is running these three programs that i mentioned and basically in an era when so much of power wealth and authority is concentrated in the hands of so few such public watchdogs who are also actually promoting the concept of governance, good governance, uh, running clinics for right to information and uh, uh, providing assistance, especially to the weaker segments to make sure that they are not uh, badly treated by the authorities. And we have no better person than uh, uh, Mr. Julio Ribeiro, who has worked tirelessly in the field of public life having faced flack on various occasions, but he is fearless and continues to work in this area. And then last but not the least, let me mention the uh, organization which is currently taking up the coordination responsibility, that is the Chamber of Tax Consultants. Uh, this, of course, is a body which was uh, established. Uh, it is amongst the oldest professional bodies, 95 years into its uh, functioning and still going strong. Uh, it's got a great tradition of independence and professionalism. It has its own publications, again, where Narayan Bhai was very intimately involved in that. And has now spread its wings into various cities, including Delhi, where it has a chapter, and various other metropolitan cities where we, uh, the chamber has uh, its study circles and so on. Uh, representing the chamber we have with us, his president, Mr. Anish Thakkar, the CA, uh, CA Mr. Anish Thakkar. Uh, I would request Anish to kindly take over and formally welcome all the participants in the seminar. Thank you, Jayant. Thank you very much for your opening remarks. Uh, you know, learned speakers uh, of uh, today's evening uh, and, uh, you know, all of them are really, really very learned. So, uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, learned speakers of today evening, uh, today's evening, the awardees, uh, presidents uh, of the various uh, co-hosting institutions and ladies and gentlemen. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you today and I am privileged to be officiating as the 44th president of the Chamber of Tax Consultants. As Jayan said, the organization is into its 95th year. Narayan Bhai has been a past president of the chamber and it was, you know, during his year of presidentship in 1990 that my guru and senior partner, Maganlal Thakkar, he inducted me into the chamber, he made me take up life membership of the chamber, a decision which I haven't regretted ever, right? Uh, and therefore, uh, you know, uh, there is a special bond with uh, Narayan Bhai on that account. Narayan Bhai, as Jayant really said, was a visionary. He, you know, loved to experiment with different things, right? And he always was willing to do something which at first blush seemed audacious. But, you know, uh, he was, when he was convinced about an idea, he would always support that idea and say, go ahead, you know, carry on. Uh, from a personal front, again, I had the... Uh, privilege to interact with Narayan Bhai very closely. My uh, guru, again, Magan Bhai, took me to the Thursday group and made me a part of the Thursday group, where we used to meet at AJ Shah's office, uh, Pradeep Bhai's office, every uh, Thursday. And, you know, I had the good fortune of, uh, you know, interacting with uh, stalwarts uh, such as uh, Narayan Bhai, Pradeep Bhai, uh, V.H. Patil, Arvind Dalal, you know, I, the list will go on and on, Virendra Bhai, you know, the list will just go on and on. Uh, and, you know, I think that shaped my learning or yearning for education. And I think that, you know, Narayan Bhai also played a great uh, role in, uh, you know, uh, cultivating the uh, hunger for learning. 
as far as i am concerned uh, we also share another special bond in that we are you know we were cancer survivors i still am um, you know and and you know uh, we uh, at some occasions did get chance uh, to interact with each other on that plane as well and discuss about you know effects of chemotherapy or what to eat what not to eat how much to eat etc i still remember you know we were at uh, hasmuk bhai parikh's uh, child's wedding uh, in brabon stadium in uh, church gate where you know we had a very very lengthy and very very warm conversation is something that i would never forget and also you know when i was ailing pradeep bhai on behalf of the thursday group sent me a very very wonderful message which inspired me to really come back so yes uh, you know uh, narayan bhai has been very very instrumental as far as me personally as well as the chamber is concerned uh, i do uh, you know uh, feel proud and privileged that when i am officiating as president uh, you know we are uh, the chamber is hosting uh, the narayan verma memorial lecture and i would want to acknowledge and thank each of the other uh, institutions here because they helped us uh, you know uh, the chamber is really a little bit of a late entrant into this because last year vipul choksi was the president uh, at the bcas agm said that we should do something jointly with the bcas in the memory of narayan bhai and you know bcas president at that time manish sampath was gracious enough to say why don't you join this initiative and you know i'm glad that we did and uh, you know thank you very much uh, manish for letting us and you know this time also suhas has been such a great support and javed i would want to mention very particularly uh, has really really helped uh, from the chamber side i would want to acknowledge uh, mishta premal ashita and pradeep they have again you know really really helped with that again let me welcome all of you thank you all for attending let's hope we have a very uh, you know uh, interesting and uh, educative session ahead uh, back to jayan thank you very much thank you anish but i believe there is some video that is to go on right now yes so can we have the video of narayan bhai's uh, uh, you know photographs please right i think uh, the whole uh, montage was at a pretty crisp pace but then we have got narayan bhai has had so many facets to his personality and so much to share but before we move on i would like uh, mrs uh, pursula narayan verma is here with us but she has uh, sent a message which she has uh, requested that may be read out rather than her repeating that so i will just share that message with you in a moment it would be there on your screen but for the record i'll just read it out uh what she has mentioned this is a message from mrs ursula narayan verma and the family of course is that we can hardly believe that it has been 5 years since narayan has left us his birthday on 20th is a good day to remember him to appreciate how he lived his life on his own terms of which some were honesty goodness and professionalism we feel we feel good to share his memory with his friends and i would just add that with his friends uh, disciples and admirers if i may say so thank you very much for the message i think i can now move on to the uh, next uh, aspect that we will be dealing with uh, Uh, 
uh, I would now request, just making sure that I am in the right sequence, uh, I would now request uh, Mr. Paramjit Singh of Dharmbarki Mission to introduce our three eminent speakers and then we will have each of them address us. Mr. Paramjit Singh, please. Thank you, Jainji. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as a famous quote says, uh, happiness is overrated. Uh, what gets you through life is purpose. Most people are obsessed with getting, searching for happiness. We spend our entire life looking for happiness. But what we fail to realize is that happiness is a byproduct. It will come if we lead a life full of purpose. To make this program purposeful, as Mr. Jain has already pointed out, every year we call some good speakers who can motivate and inspire us further and make our life purposeful. In the past, we have had distinguished speakers like Mrs. Aruna Roy, Dr. Sashikala Gurpur, Mr. Vallabh Bansali, and Mr. Vyach Malegao. This year, we have had the privilege of having not one, but three very eminent people, and it is my privilege to introduce them to all of you. Our first speaker is Dr. Heyman Thakkar. Dr. Heyman Thakkar is an eminent physician practicing in Mumbai. In addition to general medicine and therapeutics, he specializes in cardiometabolic disorders and has more than three decades of experience in this field. He is currently the consulting physician at Bhatia Hospital and Beach Candy Hospital and has his own clinic also. He did his MBBS from the SAIT GS Medical College and MD in Medicine and Therapeutics from KM Hospital. He is a member of the Royal Society of Health London and has, has been awarded a fellowship of the American College of Clinical Endocrinology in recognition of his meritorious work in diabetes and cardiometabolic disorders. He is also the Chief Medical Advisor at Bennett Coleman and Company Limited and Northern Marine Shipping Division and the medical consultant for Mondial Assistance, a Paris-based international insurance and health organization. Dr. Thakkar has been the principal investigator in more than 35 multi-centric international and national studies. He has published several papers, written textbook chapters and articles in reputed medical journals. He is a good orator and as we will see today, we are all looking forward to hearing from him. So welcome Dr. Thakkar and uh, look forward to hearing from you. Our second speaker is Havubi Bhagwagar, Bhagwagar, who is a psychologist and a psychotherapist with over 20 years of experience. She did her master's in clinical psychology from SNDT University and is currently a PhD scholar at the Tata Institute of Social Sciences. She's also an international affiliate with the American Psychological Association. She volunteers with NGOs and writes regularly for various publications. She's been awarded Women's Achiever 2017 by the Young Environmentalists and is also the recipient of Times Healthcare Achiever Award 2018. As a motivational speaker, Avovi has been invited as a trainer, coach, and panel expert at various mental health events. She also writes to raise awareness about mental health issues through her blog and through media. She is currently a panel expert for Bipolar India, a peer support group for bipolar disorder and depression patients in India. So welcome, Avi. We are all looking forward to hearing in these times, very relevant uh, times. Our third speaker today uh, is Ms. C.A. Sanjay Dhruv, who is a partner of JK Company Chartered Accountants in Mumbai. He specializes in direct tax and audit of public companies. He was a treasurer of the Rotary Club and at present is a trustee and treasurer of Jhalawar Charitable Trust. He is a COVID survivor and he will share his experience with us. This introduction, a very warm welcome to our three panelists and I will now request Dr. Heyman Thakkar to give his talk. Welcome, sir. Good evening, everybody. I am happy that we are meeting in memory of Mr. Verma, and we have such a galaxy of people already here to listen to all of us. And when I was asked to come and address and speak on this occasion, I was wondering whether they wanted a medical talk or they wanted a general talk. But when I realized 
from the topic that it was COVID today, tomorrow, and after. I realize that we are probably looking at a broad outcome to look at and educate people about this first ever pandemic which all of us sitting here have ever seen in our lives. Because this is a condition which has set the whole clock differently. I won't say it set the clock back, but we have now had to wind the clock in a different way. As you see here on my first slide, I've said COVID-19, more than half the year is over, more than three fourths of the monsoon is gone. We have almost completed the major part of COVID-20 and we don't know how long this will go on. And in view of this, I'm reminded of Bill Gates who said that this is the first modern pandemic because there have been pandemics in the past. As you can see here, unfortunately, 20 has something sinister, ominous, and probably scary. 1720 was plague, 1820 was cholera, 1920 Spanish flu. If there is anybody amongst us who has, was around at the time of the Spanish flu, please identify yourself on the chat mode or let us know. It would be a delight to hear your experience of then and now. And in 2020, we're stuck with Chinese coronavirus. So there is something in numerology, there is something in history, there is something in prediction, which is definitely there, which we have to ease out, pry out and solve. So we come to what is COVID now. As we all know, I don't want to make it very medical because most of the people know the basics, but I'll just refresh everybody's memory that COVID is a viral infection. It's respiratory mainly in origin as far as the bug getting in from the nose and the mouth and the air passages. The silver lining is 85% of patients contracting the infection will never know they had it, which means they are asymptomatic. Of the remaining 15, 10% will have anything from mild, moderate variety of infection, which can be treated with routine measures, which definitely can be treated at home. And of the 5% that develop moderate to moderately severe, only two to 3% need hospitalization or need oxygen care. Even amongst that 5%, the majority can be treated under close medical supervision, maybe nursing home care, maybe hospital care, but definitely the ICU care is reserved for 1% to 2% of the total. So let's understand that while COVID is something that we don't know anything much about, something that you can't see, you can't hear, you can't feel, you can't smell, it's all over. So it's a little bit of a mystery, a lot of mystery, but COVID is not unsurmountable. Talk about the world wars that we had in the last century. The doctors always followed the soldier because there were casualties and you could see the bullets, you could anticipate the bombs and you knew that when you went to the front, there would be casualties. Now, it is the doctor who is leading the military because he's going in with his PPE, not knowing, not seeing, not smelling and not touching the enemy. That's the difference. I'm not here to glorify the medical profession, but I'm just trying to show you the difference as to how much health care and health care is meant by all the way from sweepers, to ward boys, to sisters, to ambulance drivers, to doctors, even the pharma industry contributes to healthcare. So the planners and the plotters, and I'm glad I'm talking to such a respectable association 
who has a voice and who will make their voice heard when it comes to the fact that some portion, a larger portion, a greater portion of anyone's assets, savings and planning has to go into health care. I hope the people all over the world, especially in New Delhi, are listening to this meeting so that they realize that along with all the helicopters and the rifles, one needs medical help. We all know that this was born in Wuhan, nurtured in Wuhan, spread from China, and brought all over the world, mainly by the aerial route because of close contact. China is as densely populated, if not more than our country. And the close contact between people, as you can see on the left side, see the close contact between the two gentlemen, see what it resulted in now, and see what can happen if you this kind have to contact. So if you have to distance yourself and have moderate risk, you have to be in the center picture and it's the low risk. I'm glad that the Ministry of Finance is looking into the softer and the other digital aspects of taxation and other things so that exposure from different clients, exposure from different people, even of the chartered accountants is minimized. Today, since the last four to five months, this is what life has been all about. The telephone, the laptop, eating and sleeping. You don't have to worry about which tie will match with which jacket. You don't have to worry about which pocket square and which pair of shoes. In fact, when you're even talking on the laptop in all these Zoom meetings, nobody gives a damn whether you're wearing shorts or whether you're wearing trousers, as long as you're wearing a shirt where people see you. This is the Bermuda Triangle, which has been enforced from work from home, meet from home, dialogue from home, and meetings like this from home. But that has had its negative problems because when you eat and sleep and only become a couch person, whether you're watching television or whether you're on the digital media, you keep eating. And if you don't exercise, if you take the lockdown so seriously that you haven't even walked at home, then even the buttons of your genes start social distancing. We've seen some of our patients on the flip side developing obesity like this, and each tire around the middle has a month written around it. But I must say, as I had written in the Times of India a couple of months ago, that there have been people who've become extremely obedient, who've become extremely careful. And if one half of the coin has spilt over into obesity, the equal half, if not more, has learned to be careful has started eating carefully, started exercising, all the eating out. I'm sure if we were today not in COVID times, before this meeting, the organizers would have had savory snacks and probably tea, coffee, either before or after. And these fried foods can come home to roost anywhere. But a lot of my patients have lost weight. Their doses have dropped. Probably they are not eating the wrong things outside. Maybe their wives are keeping a punitive eye on them. The alcohol is not there or is controlled. You don't want to smoke in the four walls of home. So remember, the lockdown has had flip benefits, good and bad. But the biggest problem that we have seen in the lockdown is the problem of social media. Everybody in this country is a doctor except the doctor. And the WhatsApp doctor, the master's degree in WhatsApp, is the one that is spreading the fear of contagion. Everybody knows everything about coronavirus. I'll tell you a little story about the papaya seeds and dengue. 
We have treated millions and thousands of patients in the last five, six, seven, eight years of dengue without papaya seeds. And when the patient takes it silently, quietly with papaya seeds. So all you need is a nicely contrived WhatsApp media, which can tell you, and then you will start following it. Today, the prices of Cada, turmeric, haldi, and other things have gone through the roof. Because people want to suck vitamin C. I've had people coming with kidney stones because enthusiastic patients are taking two and three tablets of full dose vitamin C so that they keep the COVID away. I won't be surprised if we get an overdose of zinc to keep the COVID away. Please refrain from uninformed media sources who tell you because they have nothing better to do. Today, the absolute reliance of people on the WhatsApp media is going to be and has been the bane of a lot of modern civilized people. When you get a problem, you have to look at your problem well. Sitting inside the lockdown, either you can paint the bars or you can paint the sea. The art of knowing what to understand, what to decipher and what to ignore. Life would be beautiful if you knew what to ignore. And half of the patients, I would say not half, 70% of patients coming to me or video consulting to me have COVID in their minds, have COVID in their hearts, but not COVID in their system. I've had people testing. You know, there was a time when people used to get chest pain, whether they got it because they went to the gym, whether they ate spicy food, had too much whiskey or otherwise. All they would do is, sir, we want one ECG. Cardiogram nikal na hai. And the moment you said the ECG was normal, the chest pain would disappear. I can have in my list at least 300 people who have had the COVID test no less than five times because every time they had a fresh symptom or they had a little altered sense of smell, or a little karash in the throat, they straight away went for the COVID test. And everybody blames doctors and everybody blames pathologists. But if you do not look after this mental symptom, what happens to COVID? The biggest problem of COVID is mental COVID, not respiratory, cardiac, or gastric COVID. All you should do, it's like this, in the beginning, we were only told that few people have to wear masks. Those that are infected, those that are suspected, and those that are contacts. The aim of this slide is to show you that things have changed. Today, the mask has become a part of our attire. Everybody will have to wear masks. I'm sure the Louis Vuitton and all the designers will come up with colorful, batik, red, pink masks. Because I can't wear a tie and a woman can't wear a scarf. So maybe they'll wear colorful masks. But what was mask for a few has become mask for all. So you have to think on your feet. You don't only have to look at social media. Social distancing is still the key. If you have to prevent the corona, you have to distance. What was first 10 feet with every month that went by is now almost shoulder to shoulder. People don't worry. The moment the shutters of the wine shop opened, there was alcohol in the mind and no COVID in the heart. And that's why people did what they wanted to do. You know, there is one hypothesis that if every person in the world stood at one place for 90 seconds, COVID would disappear because there would be no transmission. But that can never happen. And if that can never happen, that's why we still have to maintain six feet of distance at all times in public. Without protective measures and with protective measures, you can see how the curve 
shapes itself. Question of wearing the mask. You go out for a walk in the morning or you go sometimes to do some grocery shopping and Indians wear the mask like the middleman. They wear it round their chin. They wear it round their neck. You have to cover all the entry points into the respiratory system, the nose and the mouth. And if you take your mask off for something, for God's sake, the exposed area of the neck is the one where all the germs and the viruses are sitting. If you bring your mask down from the left to the middle one, the mask inside of the mask will get contaminated. And then when you put your mask back on your lips, you will inhale all the bacteria and the viruses. If you have to have a drink of water, if you have to eat something, take your whole mask out, keep it on the table with the outer surface on the table in contact and the good surface up facing the sky. So when you wear it again, this is also a technique. Wearing it is a technique, storing is a technique, and re-wearing it is also a technique. Remember, don't wear the mask because you've been told to. Wear the mask because you want to protect yourself. Can you call me after 15 minutes, please? Remember, you carry a rifle to protect yourself not to wear it on your hip so that you look like a soldier. The same analogy is true. Today, the World Health Organization has come up with a lot of good advice for caregivers, home care, ensure that the ill person is given enough food and drink with nutrition in the mind. Whenever you're with the sick person, wear the mask. If you go into his room, wear the mask. Do not touch the mask or the face during use. Remember, all of us touch our face 62 times at least in one hour. All the time, either the nose, the forehead, the eyes, the cheeks. So desist from touching the face. Whenever you get a chance, clean your hands with soap and water or an alcohol-based rub, especially if you have had contact with somebody who is suffering. If you are going and looking after them after going to and fro into his room, and definitely wash before eating and using and after using the toilet. The sick person in your house doesn't have to be treated like an achut. It doesn't have to be an untouchable but his utensils, his towels, his linen, and all his personal belongings have to be kept separate. And you have to wear gloves if you have to wash them, either with a few drops of antiseptic or soap and water. Common articles, which are called fomites, the handle of a door, the knob of a window pane, the receiver of a phone, that should be disinfected. And all this, while you're looking after your seniors at home, happy to look after them, if there is any problem, immediately contact the healthcare facility next to you. This will prevent the fatality rate which we are seeing. Don't be afraid. The problem with our city and our country is people are afraid to go and get themselves checked because they feel the municipality will take them away. Sure enough, there is a method in everybody's madness. But if you have your doctor or your point of care person, physician, who tells you that I am monitoring him with oxygen saturation, temperature, you can still stay at home. What about this next point that you asked me to talk about? COVID next and beyond. If I was to go back to Mahabharata and Ramayana, we were in Satyug when good and evil were in two different worlds. In Tretayug, they lived in the same world, Ram and Ravan. In Dwaparyug, they were in the same family, the Kauravas and the Pandavas. But in Kalyug, they are in the same person. Unfortunately, man has exploited nature Man has used science as a weapon 
to exploit everything to his own benefit that we are unfortunately in Kaliyug. So we have a new normal. We have to look at world and stop the spread of COVID-19. Help protect those who need it most. Avoid touching your face, cough in your elbow, clean your hands, one meter or three feet distance. Please avoid crowded places and limit it in your time as far as enclosed spaces is concerned. I still think the time hasn't come for people to flock together, either to social meetings or to seminars or to cinemas, etc. Clean, be hygienic. If you don't have a worry for yourself because you're young and you're healthy, think of the elderly seniors at home. But unfortunately, this virus has really not left any medical rules. We as doctors also are getting conflicting presentations. We don't have a single bullet or a silver bullet. So we are learning and we are thinking on our feet. The physician, when he sees a condition like this, he wants to ask for the pathology report. And the pathology gets something which they are not able to construe. They want a CT scan or an X-ray. So the radiologist comes in. And when the X-ray is abnormal, they again want a clinical correlation. Now, I'm not mocking any of these professions, but I'm wanting to put across to all my learned fellow professionals. And I consider chartered accountants, lawyers, advocates, and all of us as one community because we are a community of professionals, that this is the new virus, whether it was born or the, whether it was made to develop in some place, we still don't know. The virus is not even a year old. We don't know how it's going to behave. So one has to see. And if we are thinking and learning on our feet, we are not experimenting, but we are taking the decision on compassionate grounds. So in COVID then and COVID beyond, all of you will have to help support your other professional colleagues like the doctors who are trying their best, who are innovating. Indians are great at jugaad and necessity is the mother of all invention. We are trying our best within our limited resources to give everything to the patient, whatever he or she needs. With only one thing in mind, we are chasing the pot at the end of the rainbow and that is cure. So bear with us, bear with the investigations, bear with the medicines. Somewhere, sometime there will be light. Until then, look what has happened to us. We used to rule the animals. We used to be the king of everything. Today, the animals are ruling us. They are laughing at us because nothing has happened to them. The people who had cowpox never had smallpox. So one was contrary to the other. Whoever thought that you could go to a bank dressed like this? Until last year, if you went to a bank dressed like this, they would call the security office and press the buzzer. But things are changed. Things are evolving. Have you thought of taking your son, your little one, or your grandchild to school next year? I'm not even talking about this year because school and other things have gone by. And what will a resume look when somebody applies to you next year? They will ask you what you did in 2020 and you can say you washed your hands. Which brings me to the future, the vaccine. Everybody is waiting with bated breath, thinking the vaccine will be here. The vaccine is a process which will take a long time, which needs to be perfected. If everybody wants to heave a sigh of relief and hang their hat on the vaccine, this vaccine better be good. And so that it better be good, it better be tested. Let's not make things in a hurry. For that lady who delivers prematurely after seven months, the child suffers after birth.
for treatment in neonatal care. Let's not fast forward. There is no race, whether Russia wins, America wins, Oxford wins, or Punawala wins. We want human beings to win and win over this virus. Until then, we will have to keep care, keep be careful, and who knows which will come first, the vaccine or the next Valentine Day. And if it's the Valentine Day, you will have to go and ask, will you be my quarantine? The motto for COVID this year should be, and I'm serious, what Jack Ma said. For people in business, 2020 is really just a year of staying alive. Don't even talk about your dreams or plans. Just make sure you stay alive, because if you stay alive, you would have made a profit already. I'm saying this not because the mortality rate is high, but if you do get COVID and if you don't look after yourself, you can develop a little respiratory disability, which can catch up with you in the later years. I know all men are so fed up at home and locked up that you may even dare to save somebody's number as COVID-19 in lighter vein. Bear with everybody. Remember, COVID is something which is here to stay. We'll have to learn to live with COVID. And if we learn to live with COVID, we will absolutely win this battle. Because as we are seeing, more and more people have COVID, but less and less of these people have symptoms. Less and less of them are coming to ICUs. So the virulence of the bug is dwindling. COVID then, COVID now, and COVID for the future. Let's join our hands. And I'm happy that this association has thought of putting this theme and scheme forward. Because this is a once in a lifetime. I hope in my lifetime, this is a once in a lifetime experience. Thank you for your attention. I'm sorry if I have overstayed my time. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tucker. Tucker. Uh, no question of uh, any overs. The topic is so crucial and uh, you have put it as firmly and bluntly as it needs to be stated. I'm sure all the participants will uh, draw the right lessons from it and uh, take it to heart and see that they improve themselves first. I think that's the bottom line that each of us need to do. Uh, without any further... Uh, because there, we've got three... With everybody's sir. permission, I have other yes. commitments. May I exit? Yes, of course, sir. Please, please don't take it amiss. I would have loved to stay the whole meeting. But unfortunately, there's too much of pressure from hospitals. Thank you. you. Stay safe, everybody. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Right. So, uh, we, will, we will move on to the next speaker without any uh, break. I'll share... Uh, Ms. Vovi uh, Bhagwagar has already been introduced to you by Paramjit Singh earlier. Without taking up your time, I, uh, I wouldn't say the floor is yours, the screen is yours, ma'am. Thank you so much, Janji, for introducing me and uh, thank you so much for inviting me to this eminent panel. Is my screen visible? Yes. Perfect. Okay. So, you know, I was just paying attention to the entire uh, session conducted by Dr. Hemant and every point, every slide had so much to say. Uh, everything he said we know and yet there is something to learn. So, such is, so will be the same with my presentation. I think uh, most of us now, because of WhatsApp University, because of Twitter, because of our exposure to the screens now, which has doubled, we have all become uh, mental health professionals, doctors, epidemiologists. So somewhere or the other, whatever I speak about, you would have read about, you would have known about. However, as I, uh, as Dr. Thakkar said, uh, you know, this epidemic, which is now pandemic, has totally taken us by surprise. And it has, um, I think, each day when we open the newspaper, if we open the newspaper these days, I think most of us read them on our screens. 
we uh, we wonder what is the news going to tell us what is uh, awaiting us none of us in our life lifetime unless maybe somebody who has lived through the spanish flu uh, can guide us or tell us how it felt then but none of most of us in this lifetime have never seen something like this so it's new for us life this world this way of living is new for us in fact i uh, posted on twitter some time back that as a psychotherapist as a psychologist this is the first time my client and me seem to be in the same boat of anxiety and it has never happened to me in my 20 years of career so it is um, a very very unexpected unplanned for um something we are never we weren't prepared for and yet i think that each time something like this comes in our life we will press the pause button and look back and think you know we learned something from this scenario we we took back something from it um for me always um whenever i'm in a crisis situation my reference points are very huge crisis situations i have seen in my life and um at least as a professional i have seen three such uh, events in my life that really stood out um all three were events that even india has looked at the buj calamity that happened in 2001 um uh, after that the kashmir tragedy that happened and in between that the tsunami these were three of the that i personally on site and um, i i found out that when i visited these places and worked with the people affected by trauma in these regions whether it was the people in gujarat whether it was the people in kerala or whether it was the people in kashmir uh, all the all reported a post traumatic growth they all reported that they did very well after a crisis because they learned from it and for me that stayed in my memory because if there is a crisis there will always be growth after the crisis so we all have something to in us which will change after this pandemic and perhaps after this talk maybe each one of us can explore what is that something that will change but for now uh, all of us here on the panel all of us who are watching if you can take a moment and tune in to a recent feeling that you had during the lockdown i have written some examples of feelings here but uh, you could have something else in your mind just tune in to any any recent feeling you had and think about it and stay with it name it we often don't understand that just naming a feeling naming an emotion benefits our well being so whatever be that particular emotion that you may have been feeling right now understand that it's a part of your life it may be something that recurs over and over again and if you find that it is a negative emotion then maybe through this talk today you'll find ways to work with it first of all um i want you to understand that when we have a crisis happening to us and all of us are in the middle of a crisis as dr thakkar said perhaps just surviving this year is taking all of our energy it is so impossible to plan to do you know the best things in life if each day seems like a struggle and that's the case for all of us whether we realize it or not um some of you may have heard of this person called victor frankel he was a jewish psychiatrist uh, victor frankel has written a book called man search for meaning and um, he was um, imprisoned during the uh, holocaust during world war 2 in the nazi camp and many of us have read of the tortures that happened in the nazi camps and we know that victor frankel stood out as a exemplary figure during that time because he chose to do something different the first thing he did was he chose to recognize that he is going to feel really horrible during the time that he is in the camp and from there emerged this wonderful quote that an abnormal reaction to an abnormal situation is normal so if many of us are experiencing anger we are stressed out 
we uh, we tend to become jumpy at small situations we tend to become um, annoyed easily or uh, for for a person who may have been very stoic suddenly starts crying for no reason this is normal reaction to a abnormal situation which is around us and recognizing that is part of strength recognizing and growing from that is what we or from where we develop our strength sometimes however our emotions hijack us even if we are having normal reactions to this abnormal entire situation around us our emotions which could be excessive anger which could be excessive anxiety those may hijack us and stop us from taking the right kind of measures take for example an individual who um, is ashamed that they may have got covid 19 because they are having symptoms because then if they get that illness and they go and test for it and they find out they have the illness what will happen then they will be shamed they will be told that yeah they didn't take the right precaution they will be um told that they did something completely wrong this stigma creates so much anxiety in us that it hijacks us and the icmr president himself has said that stigma and anxiety are the reasons people are not reaching out to get tested 90% of covid positive patients that they see come in the last stages because they have said we were fearful to come and get tested and that is because we are ashamed we fear we are anxious what will people think about us this is when our emotions hijack us and prevent the right kind of care that can happen during this pandemic which is why understanding about mental health in a pandemic is crucial to actually a country getting back on its feet so that's why i hope many of us can learn that when anxiety is unhealthy it makes us think very very negatively for example constantly worrying about getting the virus getting sick at the peak of the outbreak and not getting medical care though we know the curve is not flattening we know that the lockdown has allowed medical care to become much better than it was in march april and may still there are lots of people who fear that they will if they get tested what will happen if they get quarantined what will happen then comes so we have fear of the lockdown that's one fear and fear of the virus that's another fear so fear of the lockdown brings with it fears of the economic crash the total financial ruin worry that we will never get back on our feet people who are still holding supplies i have um, when i visit supermarkets i see people coming with suitcases i had posted on twitter some time back this is a site in a pandemic that we will never see people entering us supermarket with a trolley suitcase and filling up that trolley suitcase to the brim that is fear that is anxiety and my friends we all need to understand that sometimes anxiety can be very unhealthy so what do people with high anxiety do what you will see on the screen now are what we call as distortions in our thinking irrational ideas there are many of them i have displayed only five threat scanning for example it's like you know when animals get um, injured they keep looking in the environment to see that some car doesn't come and injure them or a human doesn't come and injure them we have become like those we are scanning the environment for threat all the time constantly monitoring our temperatures obsessively checking the news for updates that's an irrational way of thinking it's called threat scanning the second one is catastrophizing everything is barbadi the lockdown will shut everything off we will never ever go to a restaurant in our life we are never ever going to see a normal life again there are people who have taken this in a, a mountain out of a mole hill and the opposite of a catastrophizer is a minimizer so they you will have come across many of your friends saying ha hame to kuch nahi hota hai recently i had a doctor friend of mine uh, she is a gynecologist and um, in the early uh, times of uh, march and april we had warned her to be very careful because she was constantly delivering covid positive babies but she was saying no covid is like a phukka bomb kuch nahi hone wala hai when she was discovered uh, covid positive in july 
she did a um, online session and educated people that please don't minimize the risk of this virus because she let her guard down and because she was constantly you know without her mask and without her ppe talking to people she says i probably got it from somebody who was asymptomatic so do remember that even minimizing of a threat is a way for us to control our anxiety and that does not mean being chill does not mean that you are um, actually chill it just means that you are finding a way to cover up your emotions so another um, irrational idea is minimizing some people overestimate threats and these are the people who will uh, who are the quickest to stigmatize everybody is dangerous these are the people who find even the chinese people living in india as dangerous so they have nothing to do with the virus right these are the people who do not allow uh, nepali gurkhas to come in and uh, work in their um, compounds anymore because they believe that they have some relation to china so these people are the ones who take everything to another level of threat and many of us if we are using that as a coping skill we need to stop it there are some people who are underestimating their ability to cope i won't be able to tolerate being away from my family during the quarantine because i have no coping skills so when we face anxiety we tend to take our coping skills and crash them down believing we can do nothing so part of us getting so for us to get better from this worry and this constant anxiety is to tap into what we can cope and how we can cope in other words to build our resilience if we want to work with the pandemic in the most rational way possible then we have to work with our fear in the most rational way possible because when we are fearful and we are trying to control everything around us remember that the corona virus is something where you can try to make as much preparation as you like you can wash your hands as often as you want you can wear mask appropriately you may still get the virus but that doesn't mean you don't take any precaution you have to keep a balance there are people i know who have never left the home for this entire lockdown duration of 5 months plus and they are the people who i now see have depression so we have to keep a balance somewhere and build our resilience keeping all the safety measures and all the precautions in mind i have in the last 5 months as a psychotherapist possibly seen so many clients that i never imagined i will work this hard uh, i have worked harder than i have worked in the 20 years of my career because i have no space to think i have clients literally you know calling me up every hour every every hour i will get four to five calls um, asking for help with depression and anxiety and when i can spend time with them even on the telephone there are two things i always um, request people to do one is please keep your activity levels high and keep your social connection high because if you don't have activity in your life your serotonin levels fall serotonin is a neurotransmitter a brain chemical that allows us to feel good that makes us feel like happy and happy and if we don't do any form of exercise we don't have any activity we don't feel good social connection which can be even as we are having today via this lovely platform social connection of seeing somebody else's face of meeting somebody even at a distance wearing a mask all of this is very important a lot of people tell me you know but um, uh, doctor how will we have social connection wearing mask and uh, these mornings i am even sparing time on 8:30 in the morning every day to do a radio show on mental health because mental health as i said has become a pandemic of its own we recently spoke about how social connection can happen even with masks so even when you wear a mask though we have been used to having social connection with a whole face with a mask on also just through eye contact we can make excellent social connection so please make sure that when you meet somebody on the road and you're wearing a mask look into their eyes smile because smile is visible in the eyes also even if you can't see the lower half of that person's face it is very important to keep that social engagement going because without social engagement trust me neurons in our brain brain chemicals die the other thing which i think for building our resilience and that goes without saying is the amount of news you consume every day 
since the lockdown began if i speak just for myself i was not a big consumer of news i would maximum read on the news app you know the updates or the headlines and that was enough and between march and april i saw myself sitting in front of the tv screen or in front of twitter absorbing every piece of information my sleep suffered i was uh, becoming agitated i was not able to focus at work and then i began uh, making a rule for myself and i make a rule for my clients as well you need to switch off your phone at a particular time in the day and you need to switch off from social media completely at least for pockets in the day not through the day but for pockets you need to completely give yourself a um, fasting upas from social media from news because if you don't detox that way your body is continuously in a place of stress and it is continuously in a place of activation so if you want to go read news sources from the ones that i have displayed on the screen and if you are reading negative news please balance your information diet with uplifting news i had recently a client come to me she was sitting in front of the tv screen for something like 14 to 15 hours a day from the time she woke up to the time she slept which was late in the night she was consuming news about the recent uh, death of the actor and she would then switch screen on the tv or on her mobile and consume news about the corona virus and she would not move from that place she was almost catatonic when she was uh, brought in to me for help it she fought with me because for that one hour of session time i would not allow her to see her screen i would not allow her to move from the place she would have to sit with me and work hard in therapy she did well but like her there are many people who refuse to leave the screen who, who keep the tv on throughout the day and they are walking by they are doing their work in the kitchen they are doing their work somewhere else and the tv is continuing to blare in the background it is the worst thing that you can do if you are doing it stop it today please i would request those of you who are doing that to please stop before i end i want us to just look at this slide and many people have talked about circle of influence circle of control what is within my control what is not in my control many people believe that they need to change the government's decisions they need to enforce when schools will open they need to make sure they are helping the healthcare system cope by sending ppe kits and doing whatever they can but these are not in our control what is in your control are what is in your life in the present time some amount of social work that you can do following the guidelines keeping to a routine keeping healthy cultivating connection if you look after yourself you're doing the biggest favor to your country you don't have to be looking after thousands of people and feeding them and you know doing so much for others it would be wonderful if you did that for others but it is more important that you look after yourself and the people closest to you because that's in your circle of control in fact if all of us just did that trust me this pandemic would be much easier to manage we are instead stressing ourselves by trying to see how we can control the government not realizing that is not in our control these are some pictures familiar maybe to all of you this is from the 1918 spanish flu look at their masks look at the same kind of directives that were there even then many of us don't know that india was one of the worst affected during the spanish flu amongst all the countries in the world and we still coped we came into the internet age we have built a nation that is uh, proud of its development today in 2020 we are on the global map we lived through that we survived we thrived so there is a lot more to look forward to if our sight remains short sighted we don't see that we can survive we can cope we probably will not so always remember that our human self is far bigger than any problem that we can face so tap into your potentials tap into your skills tap into your qualities as human beings find out what you are best at this is a time when you can do it and remember 
we all will come out of it. So with that, I'd like to end. Please stay safe, keep healthy, do all the things that you can, which are within your control. Leave all those things out of your mind that are not in your control. Focus on your health, focus on your mental health. Keep your emotions and your spirits high. And I wish you all the best. Once again, thank you for having me on this platform. Thank you, Ms. Pahwagar. Uh, thank you very much for a very illuminating talk. Uh, I think you've heard from uh, both the learned speakers as to how best to cope with the situation medically as well as uh, uh, emotionally, mentally. And this is particularly a problem amongst so-called uh, intellectuals, if I may use the word so-called, because all of us are, most of us are in the professions that they tend to have more anxiety and more stress caused by anxiety. So I think uh, we need to we need to make sure that we take your advice to heart. Uh, with that, I think uh, considering that we are running a little bit late, uh, I think let me move straight away. Having heard what we should not be doing or what we should be doing, uh, one of our colleagues who had been unfortunate enough to caught up in this COVID is uh, CA Sanjay Brewer. May I request Mr. Brewer to address the members? C. Yeah. Anish Thakkar, President of Chambers of Tax Consultant. Uh, C. A. Sura right. Paranjape, President of, President of Bombay Chartered Accountant Society. C. A. Jain Gokhale, Committee members of four organizations eminent personality in the audience. I would like to thank Chambers of Tax Consultant and BCS Foundation for giving me this opportunity to share my experience of my COVID illness on the occasion of fifth late Narayan Verma lecture meeting. Much on COVID is already spoken by two other learned speakers. Today, I am here before you all as one who has survived a virus that has brought the world to a standstill. A virus that has paralyzed us all with fear and anxiety, and at the same time driven us into a frenzy for vaccines and cures. We have heard about medical and clinical consequences of COVID from the previous speakers. As one who has been through it, I would like to share with you my experience from a patient's perspective. The first thing that comes to my mind is that a COVID patient has to, under all circumstances, remain calm and fight the infection. As we have heard, it is an infection that is as bad as, if not worse, than the previous pandemics like bubonic plague and Spanish flu. Besides the physical symptoms, it is affecting people mentally, socially, economically, emotionally, and financially. Mentally, the virus makes us feel paranoid, fearful, and perpetually on edge. Did I wash my hand? Did I sanitize the bag? Did I touch anything when I went out? Should I leave the house? What if any family members get infected? These are the questions that almost every individual in the world is obsessed with. Someone coughs and we panic. A sneeze makes us edgy. Socially, a COVID positive means instant alienation. No one will and no one can come near you. You feel like an outsider in your own home. Emotionally, you are wrecked. Whether you have it or not, it is like a shadow that follows you everywhere and you don't know what to do with it. Once somebody in the family has a cough or a fever, everyone in the house gets stressed and everyone fears being infected with COVID. It takes a day to get the test done and another couple of days for the results. But these few days seem like an eternity. Family members are anxious and under tremendous stress. If one is unfortunate, 
and test positive, then the nightmare begins. Serious symptoms and decreased oxygen levels need instant hospitalization at the time when there are not enough beds. Then the scramble for influence begins. A lot of influence is required to get admission in a known hospital. This further aggravates the stress and the symptoms. Needless to say, socially you are outcasted or even worse. To give you an example, I know a family whose four members were infected with COVID. This is somewhere during the end of April. The aged father, about 75 years old, succumbed to the virus. When the bereaved family members tried to come home after the cremation, the members of the society took a severe stand and refused them entry to the building. The grieving family was forced to seek an alternative accommodation in a hotel. Instead of helping them, the so-called cooperative society added to their grief with complete disregards for their loss. Coming to my experience of COVID, on the night of 1st June 2020, I was feeling feverish and tired. Fearing the worst, I decided to self-isolate and sleep in another room. The next morning, I checked my temperature and it was about 100 degrees. I did not have any other symptoms like cough, breathlessness or sore throat. My doctor, who is also a close family friend, advised me to take a dolo, a paracetamol tablet. For the next five days in home quarantine, my fever would be normal on taking the medicine. So it was thought that I had a viral infection and got myself tested for routine checkup like malaria, typhoid, dengue. However, my blood reports were normal. So on 5th June, we decided to go for a COVID test and after arranging for the prescriptions, I got an appointment for 8th June. However, on 7th June 2020, I started coughing, felt breathless and exhausted. So my doctor asked me to get an oximeter to check the oxy oxygen levels. My oxygen levels had dropped to 91, 92. It was my diabetes and hypertension that made my doctor decide to get me admitted immediately. At a time when the virus was at its peak, I was fortunate to get a bed at an advanced multi-speciality hospital Jew. I was admitted about 10 in the night. Next morning, even before I got tested for COVID, I was taken for a chest X-ray, which showed severe pneumonia in both the lungs. The test for COVID was done through the hospital and the report was positive. My challenge with the virus began. Somehow I had to stay two steps ahead of this monster. Oxygen support began and my system began to require more and more oxygen as the days progressed. So I went from 2 liters to 15 liters. Even then, the breathlessness would not subside. Next came the decision to give me tocilizumab injection. So we were able to obtain it immediately. My body did, did not respond to that medicine at all. Next day, I was shifted to an ICU and was asked to get remdesivir another drug to combat the virus. At this point, Remdesivir was not an approved as a prescribed drug and was available only on the compassionate grounds and very few outlets. So my family and friends faced yet another challenge to procure the medicine that would have helped, that would have helped to save my life. Two days into being COVID positive, I was not only fighting the virus, but my family and friends were also struggling with the bureaucracy and protocols that are driven by influence. Once again, I was blessed to have help and contacts to procure remdesivir. But what about those who do not have and who are less fortunate and who do not have all the contacts? My family and friend had to run pillar to post to get the medicine to save my life. 
remdesivir drug is a five day course wherein i required a total of six injections two of them to be given on day one and remaining four to be given daily for the next four days i took the first dose of remdesivir on 10th june the first three days of remdesivir had no effect and my health kept deteriorating further now we faced another challenge to shift to another hospital that was better equipped to handle critical covid cases with high end infrastructure in icu and intensivist and an advanced ventilator my experience has made it clear that covid patients if they can should opt for a hospital that are competent and well equipped after all it is a fatal virus that one has to deal with decisions have to be taken quickly and treatment has to be provided urgently or there is a risk of losing one's life after nearly 5 days in the jew hospital on the night of 12 june it was with the help of my friends and relatives i was fortunate to get an icu bed in kokila ben ambani hospital only a few hours of being there my health began to get worse the doctors called my son at about 3 in the morning to inform him that my condition was critical i was put on a high flow non invasive ventilation of 60 liters of oxygen i jumped from 15 liters to 60 liters the hospital has that facility to go up of going up to 75 to 100 liters which is crucial for critical covid patients as they feel breathless and their lungs are infected during the time of hospitalization i was all alone no one was allowed to come and meet me in spite of all the loneliness and depressing hospital environment i kept my mindset total positive never allowing any negative thoughts i used to chat with my family and friends on whatsapp and even have played ludo game online with my wife son and daughter in law believe me your positive attitude and a good immune system is the biggest advantage against covid with god's grace i started responding positively to the treatment for the next two days so i was still critical my overall health started improving and my breathlessness also started reducing i attributed my health improvement to not just the medical treatment but to the power of positive thinking and infallible resolve i was determined to win the war my ammunition was my positive attitude which motivated me to eat all my meals on time staying hydrated and doing everything possible to make my immune system better never once in the hospital i skipped my meal on account of taste or due to weakness or any other reason i used to drink a lot of room temperature water i was home after 14 days of hospitalization i then remained quarantined for further 10 more days for my safety and also safety of my family even though my health has improved the lungs are still weak the breathlessness is gradually improving it will take 10 to 12 weeks for the lungs to heal and become normal daily i continue with my breathing exercise keeping in mind with the age the lungs takes a longer to heal i walk for almost 5 km daily most importantly i try to keep my sugar level as my blood pressure in check it is crucial to control diabetes and address all other pre-existing conditions the time at the hospital as well as quarantine at home was the most trying period of my life i am fortunate that my son devin along with my doctor friend were able to take charge and take all timely decisions you need family members relatives and friends to do around do do running around for getting admission to hospitals getting medicines giving moral support during this tough time my neighbors and other society members helped us in all possible manners whatever was needed 
by us was made available at our doorsteps. On my return from the hospital, all the society members gathered down at the gate to give me a warm welcome. The support given by my relatives, friends, neighbors, to me and my family members was tremendous, keeping our moral high and our hopes higher. I am not aware how I got the infection of COVID. I had gone to my office three or four times only in the period of lockdown with all the precautions like masks, hand gloves, sanitizers, and that too when only two or three staff members were present. I had never gone out for any other work including getting for household purchases also. It is very difficult to identify the source of infection and fretting around over it is futile as it adds to your stress. After being discharged from the hospital, people started asking me about my experience in hospital. So I decided to pen down my experience. I shared my experience with all my friends and relatives. I am proud to say that I was one of the few COVID patients who on his own shared his experience openly and candidly, not considering as a social stigma. The reactions were unbelievable. People were thankful that I shared my experience with you, as it was an eye-opener for everyone. And so many myths and wrong notions about COVID were clarified. It also helped them to take proper decisions, precautions, and in case of infection, the line of treatment required. So, few takeaways from my experience, which I would like to share, and Dr. Thakkar had already elaborated on it. It might be repetitive also. Until there is a global consensus on vaccines and cure, COVID could be considered as a deadly yet manageable virus. Manageable as long as we follow guidelines and protocols. Wear masks and gloves in public places. Carry a sanitizer. When you come back home, drink a glass of hot water, take bath. Avoid places and occasions where there is a chance of being in proximity with people. Maintain social distancing. If you experience symptoms, calmly quarantine yourself from other family members to reduce the risk of spreading. If symptoms continue for two or three days, get the COVID test done immediately. Keep an oximeter ready and measure your oxygen levels daily. If the level goes below 20 to 93, consult your doctor immediately. If breathlessness, seek hospitalization immediately if COVID test is not done. Most importantly, show compassion and kindness to those in need. Appreciate the frontline workers. Stay connected. Physical distancing does not mean social, emotional detachment. COVID is a nature's way of reminding us to challenge our patience, our faith, and most of all, our ability to be kind, tolerant, and united. Positivity is the best investment. Ratan Tata has said, no one can destroy iron, but its own rust can. Likewise, none can destroy a person, but his own mindset can. Keep a positive mindset and this too shall pass. My friend, this is a time to apply our knowledge to the realities that challenges us. Stay safe and take care. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjayji. Mm. And I think... Uh, all the three uh, sessions that we have had so far have actually meshed in so wonderfully. I think we had a continuous flow which actually uh, merged into each other in terms of what they have shared with us, starting from Dr. Thacker, Ms. Bhagwagar's presentation and Sanjay's. I think, uh, Anish, with your permission, looking at the time, I would skip the question-answer session unless there are yes, some very important questions put up on the chat box. Uh, I would straight away request uh, Mr. Julio Ribeiro because we have got three awards which the various organizations are intending to give to highly deserving persons. I think those need to be introduced and I'm sure uh, Mr. Ribeiro will do a, a great job introducing the logic behind and the purpose behind these various awards and then we will ask the respective heads of those organizations to present them. Mr. Ribeiro, please. Yeah. 
if you put it. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. All right. So every year, the, the Narayan Verma Memorial Lecture, it is part of our being now. We are always looking forward to it. Uh, and this is a grand finale, you know, when we uh, honor the people whom we think have added to our goals, to have enabled us to fulfill our goals, who have shown some passion for the work we are doing. And each of our, each of the con components of this uh, Narayan Varma lecture organization, we are four of us, each of us chooses our own nominee. Now, for example, PCGT usually likes to honor the young people who work with them and work with the organization. And that is what we are going to do today. But let me also add my tribute to Narayan Varma, who became part of our organization and whose uh, vid widow is now here with us. And we, we really miss him a lot. He had all those ideas. He was also so, so committed to whatever we were doing. And one of the, our main projects that we, we have got three projects, RTI, of course, being one. And we also had Kuchor, which, where we go to the schools. And that was his brainchild. So I really <laughs> think that a person like Narayan Varma is why the quality of life, at least in this big city, does not go below a certain minimum. Because uh, if we rely on government, then we will, I think that will be a sad day. We will have to have NGOs who are committed. There are different types of NGOs, I know, but there are those who are really committed. And Narayan Bhai, whichever NGO he worked with, he did it with passion, with commitment, with sincerity. And I really, we raise our hats to him. So this is uh, the why we felt that he should be commemorated not only by an annual lecture, but also by giving this award where we want other young people, others also to come up to that level to be future citizens of this country with those same values, moral and ethical, which is unfortunately sometimes something that we have forgotten we should have those values and we should have people, leaders of the future with these values and who really want to see that this country advances. So I'm, I'm, this is what I want to say about why we introduced the Narayan Verma Awards. Each of our co uh, constituents is going to give, has made a nominee. We have made ours and we will, uh, talk about them, talk about, that is a very small uh, um, introduction about, brief. brief about this, and that I will mention the citation when my turn comes again. Thank you. Right, sir. Thank you very much uh, for giving a crisp and uh, general broad introduction to the purpose and the uh, nature of the awards. Uh, I have taken the awards in random sequence. I think the office could put up uh, uh, the slide if they wish to, because each of the award carries a citation which it, with it, which you would see. Uh, the first, I would uh, call Dharan Bharti, Mr. Uh, uh, Paramjit Singh, to present the award to be given by the Dharan Bharti to uh, the recipient chosen by them. If you would like to say a word about why that award is given and then I would request the awardee to say a few words if he so wishes, he or she uh, so wish. Uh, Mr. Paramjit Singh, please. Yeah. Thank you, Jain Bhai. Uh, Dharam Bharti Mission, as the name suggests, talks about Bharatiya Dharma, our only religion being humanity. And this is what brought us all together in GBM, such stalwarts as Narayan Bhai and Pradeep Bhai. Though they are not there today physically, but they continue to guide us. And they were those, like Narayan Bhai especially, who used to walk the talk. They would not just preach that we have to do something, but they used to walk the talk. And as a result, we see today four leading organizations of Mumbai uh, coming together year after year and paying homage to him 
and to the and to celebrate his life well lived our awardee for today is one such person who personifies all these values that we cherish and who also believes in walking the talk ms chandra ruya she is a successful business woman and an equally passionate philanthropist she is an integral part of the senior management team at the raptocos breton company limited and she has been instrumental in forming and co in uh, operating raptocos bread test laboratories in thane she also holds the position of the honorary consul general of malta in mumbai and due to malta's involvement in vibrant gujarat she has been part of multiple committees her inclination towards social impact is evident from her two decades of worth of volunteering and philanthropy towards the bombay city red cross where she is a member of the managing committee she is equally passionate about organizations thalassemia blood bank and sanitation projects dbm has had the fortune of working with red cross for the last 12 years and we all know it is a highly reputed organization which works on many fronts including malnutrition urban and rural poverty elevation projects sanitation and apart from running the blood banks Ms. Ria has been involved keenly with the projects, often personally being there, as this short clip would show. I'll just share my screen. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ms. Chandra Ruya. We'll just show the uh, citation and the trophy, and then we'll request Ms. Ruya. This is the trophy, and. Uh, This is the certificate alongside. May we now request Ms. Ruya to kindly uh, speak for two minutes. Namaste, Namaste. Uh, I'm very new to this, so I've made a two-minute. Uh, uh, I've written a, two paragraphs, which I'd like to read out. I know it's been a long day, so it's going to be a really short speech. Um, uh, I had the pleasure of first meeting Mr. Narayan Verma about 10 years ago when I attended one of Dharma Bharti Mission's uh, midday meal program in Govandi in Bombay. Over the uh, few times that we met after that, um, I learned so much from this wonderful man uh, about philanthropy and giving back to society. Uh, and so it's truly an honor and a pleasure to receive this award in his name. Uh, I have been with the Red Cross now for over two decades. Uh, and one of my passionate projects has been water, sanitation, toilet building programs in the rural outskirts of uh, Mumbai. And I'm very pleased to say we have made a difference in more than 15 villages. Having said that, I must admit that's a seen the progress that they have made with their midday meal, which we support with them. And it's really been successful. And uh, we can see the success by the amount of the, the number of the students uh, that have gone on to university and have uh, got good jobs and made a good life for ourselves, themselves rather. Uh, now, this pandemic has been a challenging time for our organization because one of our activities is the Bombay City uh, Blood Bank. And if, uh, one of our projects there is giving free blood transfusions to thalassemia patients. And organizing uh, blood donation drives has been very, very, very difficult. Uh, but we have managed somehow and it's been an uphill task, but not a single one of our thalassemia patients has been turned away. 
Uh, if there's anything we should learn from this pandemic is that we must continue our work with new dedication and move forward with enthusiasm uh, and, and hope. And on this note, I must say a special thanks to Dharma Bharti Mission, uh, Mr. Paranjit Singh, Fareen, you've become a great good friend and, uh, and for recognizing me and championing uh, ch charities like the Red Cross that make the world a better place, I hope. Thank you and namaste. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Ria. And uh, good to hear your uh, sense of joy from what you've been able to achieve. Although all of us are conscious that it seems to be a drop in the ocean, but nevertheless, a very valuable drop. Uh, may I then request the president of the BCS, uh, who is representing the BCS Foundation, uh, to give his uh, introduction to the winner of the award instituted by the BCS Foundation and to say about the foundation itself. Mr. Sir Suhas Paranspe. Thank you, Jain Bhai. Uh, respected members of Sri Narayan Verma family, uh, respected Ribero sir and all the dignitaries on the virtual dais, seniors and friends. Uh, I introduce CA Sanjay Hegde. Date Sri Narayan Verma Awardee of BCS Foundation for the year 2021. Sanjay Hegde is a chartered accountant by profession and LLB from Government Law College, Mumbai. He was an executive director uh, with a global capital market group at Price uh, Waterhouse Coopers and Private Limited India, that is PWC with an expertise to advise the clients on US GAAP, IFRS, Indian GAAP, and on international offerings. He advised many Indians as well as international clients. Uh, coming to his social uh, profile, he is one of the promoters of Seva Sahayog Foundation, which acts as a bridge between the NGOs and corporates and society at large. He is currently one of the directors. Seva Sahayog works with more than 300 NGOs across Maharashtra. The foundation has been working largely in the area of education of unprivileged children with currently 8,000 students under its wings. They have recently started a program, science and technical education program which has been implemented in over 70 rural schools. Seva Sayog through Seva Fair helps rural NGOs in marketing their products to corporate employees through stalls at such corporates. Uh, there are many other uh, uh, activities, social activities, which Mr. Sanjay is involved in. He is a founder of Ami Goekar, he is mainly from Goa. He is a treasurer of Seva International. He has done a lot of work under the project Nivara for villages and people severely affected by Cyclone Nisarga recently. He is a founder trustee of Krishna Savitri Charitable Trust, his parents in the, in the name of his parents. He is a president of Samtol Foundation. He is a trustee of Manav Sadan Vikas Saustha. He is a member of Friends of Hegdewar Hospital and one of the promoters of Gulmohar Area Society's welfare group Juhu. He is also a member of Local Governance Council of Rahejas College of Architecture. Our RTS congratulations to you, CA Sanjay Hegde, on behalf of BCA family and wish you an active social life in the years to come. Now may I request Mr. Hegde to share his few thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Suhajji. Am I audible? Yes, yes sir. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you everyone 
whom I can see and whom I can't, I don't see on the screen. Uh, it's a great honor to be felicitated by and be recommended by a Bombay Chartered Accountant Society. Uh, I must thank Suhaji personally for reaching out to me. I only agreed to be here for one a couple of reasons. Suhaji has already mentioned the activities, what we do, and I don't want to labor on that. But I just want to give a confidence to each one of you. Obviously, some of you I know personally, Jayanji I know, but many of you I might not be knowing. Uh, I, we heard Chandraji, but my story and Seva's story is, can be a common man's story. There's nothing in me which is different from you and me. Yes, we have stepped out. We have, I mean, I was born in a middle class family in uh, Goa. I came to Bombay in search of greener pastures, became a chartered accountant, became a partner in PricewaterhouseCoopers. I learned that, that NGO at large do not think big. Very few NGOs would really think big. So their ideas and their activities get restricted. That's where people like us who have run big organizations, who have partnered with many network with many industrialists and have the experience of thinking big can come together and help these NGOs to build capacities. And I'm sure each one of you on the screen and present here can do that. So Seva Sayuk journey has been from an institution, from an individual to an institution building. If at all, there are many friends and colleagues of mine who have helped this journey I was not the originator of this. I joined a couple of people from Pune who had started this idea in an unorganized or unofficial way. I helped them to actually put an institution behind it, register it, get an FCRA. And today we are working with many companies, at least 200, 300 companies. So it's been a fascinating journey, very satisfying journey. And uh, each one of us can definitely undertake that journey and that is also a need of the hour. In the COVID times, we have been able to reach out to probably uh, thousands of family in distress with four kids. We have given almost 15,000 PPE kits to various hospitals in Mumbai. We have given HFNC machines to various municipal hospitals. This is because of our network. And that is something which we developed through our professional network abilities, which has come to a great help during COVID times. So each one of us carry that network. It is said that if you know seven person in the world, you can reach out to anybody in the world, provided there is will to do something. I think this network and chartered accountants are in unique position. They are trustee, they are auditors for a, a good trust which has got financial muscle. They are also auditors where there's a requirement to meet underprivileged needs. They are auditors for corporates where there is a CSR money and management is still thinking. So there are so many qualities and attributes of a chartered accountant which can be put to use in actually creating some unique work. We actually created a CFO society initiative under Seva Sayo and I will reach out to that's one reason why I actually agreed. I would not have met in my lifetime all of you, but within three minutes, I could probably pass on my message. And that's the only sole reason I did not hesitate to agree with Paranspe that I will, yes, I will accept this award. So thank you very much. Uh, it's a, everyone has to step out and do whatever we can. I'm not a preacher that everybody has to do social service. But if someone intends to do that, we need to institutionalize that rather than being uh, sort of a, a, a limited by our individual capacity, the individual threat of being fa a failure. So that's the message I want to give. Uh, as regards time, COVID has taught us that we have enough time. People complain, I have no time for these things. I have the week. But I'm sure each one of us have a learning like me throughout this four or five months period. Yes, 
If required, we can find time. And it is essential to find time for good things because life can be in danger for no reason. I, I mean, COVID may be some 0, 0, 0 point milligram or milliliter, whatever it's called it, can devastate our life in no time. So there is no tomorrow. We have to do it today. I will end this two minute speech, three minute speech by saying a sloka. There's a Sanskrit sloka by Chanakya. Sukasya mulam dharma. For happiness, there has to be, the base has to be righteousness. Dharmas mulam artha. For every righteousness, you need wealth. Wealth is not bad. It is the purpose for which it is used may be bad. And arthas mulam rajyam. Rajyam is like an institution. So I would like to say that whatever we do, we need to build big institutions to ensure the work we are doing is sustainable and it really helps the needy. We have mapped our activities under sustainability goals of uh, United Nations and we have footprints on 16 out of 17 goals were laid down by both Niti Aayog and uh, United Nations. We are not saying we have done big activities, but there are footprints we have created. Any of you would like to speak to me individually, I'm more than happy. I'm available 24 by 7. Thank you very much once again for giving me this honor of uh, taking the award in the name of Mr. Narin Verma and giving me this opportunity to talk to you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Sanjay ji. And those of you who have interacted with Narayan Bhai will recall he is almost echoing the thoughts of using networking, of trying to do good. And most important, as Sanjay ji mentioned, uh, because Suhas gave such an, uh, uh, Suhas Paranspe gave such an elaborate uh, detailing of the various organizations Sanjay ji is involved in. Uh, since most of our audience comprises of professionals, let me share another secret that which I think will go to forward what Sanjay ji has said, that he is not full-time into social work, although post now uh, due to age, he might have focused on that. He is a thoroughly active professional. I've had occasion to sit across the fence with him, discuss intricate matters of accounting standards. And I can tell you, he was more up to date than possibly I was. And uh, he was... Uh, uh, a thorough professional, whether on the academic side or whether on the uh, performance side. So I think why I'm mentioning this is all of us professionals tend to believe that I am too busy to get into all these activities. I think Sanjay ji is a living example and possibly rightly given the award by uh, BCA's foundation. Let me come to the last award and uh, since Mr. Ribeiro had batted first, he comes in for the second innings once again to present the award from your uh, trust, Mr. Ribeiro. Yeah. You know, we, the PCGT works with students. We are interested in getting much better citizens in this country, better, better leaders, those with moral and ethical values. And that is what we are trying to do. We interact with students of all the colleges in Mumbai, particularly the law colleges. And we have a, 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 a program of interns. That is, they come to us for the law students have to do an internship with an NGO. And our test of success is whether these NGOs, after they have taken that certificate that they have attended for one month, whether they come back to us, whether they are still interested in our work. And that is what, what, what interests us. And Arjun Kadam, the young man who, to whom we have given this uh, award, uh, perhaps he was there at the time of Narayan Verma also, I'm not sure. But he has been one of our star students. And I was pleasantly surprised that after so many years he had been with us, he brings his father to meet me. And his father tells me, sir, at your time, when you were commissioner of police here, I was recruited as a constable. And uh, this young man, that is my son, was born in the police lines. And he had been, uh, he and his sister are both going to become lawyers. 
So I said, I'm very happy. I'm very happy to know that the policemen now want their children to be educated and do something more than being a policeman. Uh, uh, Arjun's father, when he came to meet me, had already become a sub-inspector, that is toward the end of his service. And he was in the traffic branch. So he is like family for me. And uh, I was very happy to, to uh, I must say, I also did a great bit to influence my coup trustees that we should give it to Arjun. He is one of our uh, very bright, and not only bright, but enthusiastic. Because even when he was in studying in college, and after that, when he has already joined a law firm, he comes to our office. He takes part in many of our functions, which we have throughout the year. And uh, he also gives his time because he goes uh, to the colleges to talk about the RTI, the right to service also, which is a state act, Maharashtra Government Act, which will help in good governance. And he had done it just uh, pro bono. I mean, he never asked for anything. We felt bad about it later. He said, at least let us give him his, his transport because uh, he should come in a taxi from your high court or wherever he is. So we, we were happy to, to have him uh, as our awardee this year. And I'm quite sure that he will be one of our good citizens is what PCGT strives for and, uh, and a good leader of men. Thank you. I'll ask Arjun now to, to, to respond. Arjun, go Thank ahead. You. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Is it audible? Yes. Yes. Thank you so much, sir. It was really heartwarming to receive this honor. When we speak about awards and rewards, it is much more of an honor. But for me, this is not an honor, but a responsibility. Because as I see the co-awardees, they have done much more contribution to the society and public life than what I am at the start of my career taking baby steps in the profession. So I have done really nothing to deserve this award. But then I take it as a responsibility to do something and befit this award, make myself suitable for this award. So I take it in that aspect. I really cannot thank PCGT enough within two to three minutes, but I will have to honor the schedule of the program as well. So once again, a big thank you. When I was arguing uh, a matter as a law student at a final round of an advocacy competition before uh, some judges of the Bombay High Court sitting there. I argued, I finished my round and then they said that Mr. Kadam, we think you have done your best. But don't just tell us that you have done your best. We want better than your best. So I said, okay. So I remember of that day at this moment, I had really not decided to speak this. But I really recollect that because what PCGT has done by giving me this honor has told me that you are the best possibly, but then we expect you to do better than your best. So I will always strive for that excellence. As a lawyer today and mainly as a student of law, even today, I am reminded of the great Nandolal Bose, who was entrusted by the constitution makers to do some artwork in the constitution. So if we see the fundamental rights, he has uh, drawn Ram, Sita and Lakshman going back to Ayodhya. So possibly that's what we meant by Ram Raj, fundamental rights. If you open the directive principles, it shows Lord Krishna and Arjun at the center stage of Kurukshetra. So in the uh, situations of turmoils and turbulences, Krishna is giving directives to Arjun. And that is precisely what Mr. Ribeiro, other trustees and other mentors, which I see on the screen and off the screen, that is precisely what they have been for me. Possibly someone might say that these values and virtues are of no use in practical life. But then I am really very certain about it and I can vouch for it. Then in times of turbulences and turmoils, these work as terrific directives. And I have myself experienced it being a beneficiary of it. Given this great responsibility of making myself suitable for this award, as a junior law student, hardly any clients are ready to entrust matters with junior lawyers for obvious reasons that with their half-baked knowledge, they would not really do anything great with the matter. 
possibly they'll do much more of damage to the matter. But then PCGT and other organizations have entrusted me with this great responsibility of leading the good life and contributing something to the public in future. I am really, really not honored, but humbled by this. I am indeed thankful for this award, and I would strive for excellence. Thank you so much. Thank you, Arjun. Very well spoken. And for your young age, I must say that uh, when you have been picked by such luminaries, I am sure they see great potential in you. Not just this uh, trust, not just the trust which has helped you and supported you, but I am sure society at large will have great expectations from you. Thank you very much. And uh, with that, I think we will come to the winding up because we have slightly overshot. But nonetheless, it was all worth it and we had had such important contributions from all the luminaries here. May I request uh, one of the host organizations, Mr. Suhas Paranspe, President of uh, Bombay Chartered Accountant Society, to uh, propose a vote of thanks and uh, wind up the, the meeting. Yes, thank you, Jayan Bhai. It is my privilege to propose vote of thanks. First and foremost, we must all thank God Digital and Technology due to which this is possible today. It is in the true spirit of what Narayan Bhai always believed in show must go on under all the circumstances. Thank you, Digital Transformation. I thank Sri Narayan Verma family for their presence and being the backbone of this event. Thank you, Mrs. Ursula Verma and family members. Special thanks to uh, Ribeiro sir for his presence and thoughts. I thank all the three panelists, namely Dr. Heman Thakkar, Ms. Hevovi Bhagwa Bhagwagar, and CA Sanjay Dhru for their valuable time and sharing their knowledge and experiences and for creating positive vibrations in these unprecedented times. I must say your presentations were in sync with perpetual optimism, which Narayan Bhai always carried with him. I thank CA Jayan Gokhale for moderating the whole event seamlessly. And thank you, uh, Jayan Bhai, for sharing your connect with Narayan Bhai. I thank all the three awardees, namely CA Sanjay Hegde, Ms. Ruiya Chandra, and Advocate A.B. Kadam for gracing the occasion, for accepting the awards, and sharing their thoughts. All of you are in the same boat of social responsibility with Narayan Bhai. I thank all the trustees, office bearers, volunteers, and staff members of poor organizations, namely BCAS, CTC, DBM, and PCGT for an excellent bonding in these virtual times. I must say Narayan Bhai was much closely associated with all of you. You have actually worked with him for me, he was more of an experience and intangible. Special thanks to Mr. Javed as uh, CTC President Anish also mentioned, uh, event manager of BCS for being a common thread in all the four organizations. I thank all of you for your participation and encouragement. It is your respect and love for Narayan Bhai that you are all of you are here. I conclude this event with the hope and prayer that next year we meet in person and celebrate this event in person in uh, with a human touch. Please stay safe and take care. Good night. Thank you.